Good evening, Saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church midweek service. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. I'm not going to read the passage since I read it last week, but it's Romans 9, 14 through 26. We will be referring to verses in the passage in other places. So let's get started and we'll go to the our Father in prayer, our Abba Father, we just thank you so much for the blessings that you give us every day that we so often take for granted. As we go through these times, many of us have lost loved ones. We pray especially today for the people in Texas because we have brothers and sisters there, and we just pray for them. We pray that this would be a time that you would point men to Jesus as we break your, red, your bread open tonight. May we see Jesus in Him only. May we hear the soft sound of His sandaled feet. We pray and implore you to open hearts and minds to your truth that stony hearts would be replaced with hearts of flesh. That the Spirit would be active in the Word as it is presented tonight. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. Amen. As we are looking at this, we're um, seeing that Paul has purpose in writing 9, 10, and 11. Um, but if we go to Romans, the first chapter, verses 4 and 5, well, we'll start in verse 3. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And then we will go to Romans 16. That's the beginning of the book. We'll go to the end of the book. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. His purpose is the obedience of faith is what he is saying here in this passage. One of the things. But this is the one that we're looking at tonight. Paul understood that his calling was to proclaim the gospel to all nations with a view to bringing his hearers to the obedience of faith. We do not preach or proclaim or share Christ just to hear ourselves talk or to pat ourselves on the back because there's no backpack patting here. It is by grace that anyone is saved. But he preaches the same gospel to Jews and Gentiles alike. We see that in the end of the book of Acts where he says, um, verse 30, chapter 28, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So anyone that came into his door, Jew or Gentile, did not matter. He proclaimed the kingdom of God to them, to bring them to the obedience of faith. We see in Romans 3, Verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? 
yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised, or the Jew by faith, and the uncircumcised by faith, do we make then void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So, he preaches to all nations. We see this in um, chapter 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and call those things which be not as though they are. All nations. He's made Abraham a father of all nations, not just the Jews. All nations. And all nations will you bless people, Abraham. He was told in the covenant promise there. We see then in um, Romans 3, we're not going to read the whole passage, 10 through 20, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one, because both Jews and Gentiles are all charged as sinners. There's none who seek after God. All have turned aside. Verse 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. How applicable to today is that? Now we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Just Jews? No. Just Gentiles? No. The Jews consider the Gentiles dogs. The Gentiles considered the Jews dogs. They hated one another. But in Christ, He brought them both together to the obedience of the faith. We see that all Jews and Gentiles in this passage have sinned. And then we see that all are under sin in uh, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So all are under sin. Verse 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment or condemnation came to all men, even so through the one man's righteousness, the free gift came to all, resulting in justification. For as by one man's disobedience many were constituted sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be constituted righteous. All are under sin until they come to faith in Christ. And we see in Acts 15, since all are under sin, there is one remedy. Peter speaking. So God, this is verse 8, chapter 15, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe, this is Peter, Peter the Apostle, Jewish Apostle, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Who's they? The Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. Saved by faith in Christ, by grace and by Christ. To the glory of God the Father. Scripture alone. Is there any objection to this? Oh yes. Has the word of God failed? We saw earlier in the chapter because Jews have been cut off. Some of the people would say the word of God has failed because Jews have been cut off and they're no longer God's favored people. Well, God's purpose was never to save the entire nation. The objection seemed to be do we not have a right to the salvation that belongs to the age of the Messiah since we are Abraham's seed and heirs to the covenant promise? What Paul is saying here is not every physical descendant 
is a true Israelite. He says, not all Israel is Israel. Not every seed of Abraham is his spiritual seed. It's the spiritual seed that is saved, not the physical seed. There is a there is a believing Israel within the ethnic Israel, even now, a remnant. We see that in Romans 11, 5 through 7. Even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. If by grace and is no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace, but it is works. It is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What then? Israel was not obtained, has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. We don't know why God does certain things, but Paul is saying here that the purpose was to serve to save people in Israel, a remnant, and a remnant of Gentiles. There's a new initiative of God to take a people from the Gentiles for his name. We see in Romans 9. 23 through 26 even as he who called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles as he says in Hosea I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who is not beloved and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them you are not my people there they shall be called sons of the living God. We see in numerous places in the Old Testament that God was going to bless the nations, that God was going to call the Gentiles. We see it from Genesis to Isaiah at least. And there's other places too. But we know those are big emphases there. And also in Hosea. Now this was not an offer of salvation, but a calling of a people from the Gentiles. We see um, in Romans 8, 28 and 30. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Not our purpose. His purpose. For whom he set his love on, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, a lot of people want to be called by God, but they don't particularly care about being conformed to the image of his Son. And that is one of the fruits of the Spirit, is that we are conformed to the image of Christ. If you have no desire to be conformed to the image of Christ. Check your salvation. Because when you're born again, you want to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's a slow process sometimes. Sometimes you have great leaps forward, and other times you have a step forward and three steps back. Make your calling and election sure. Moreover, whom He predestined, those He called, those He called, He justified, so if he actually justifies somebody, this is not a this is not a possibility. This is a certainty. Those he justified, he glorified. Although that has not happened yet. We see the purpose then is to save a remnant. And it's a saving activity in a spiritual sense, not like the Old Testament liberation in a physical sense where they were called out of Egypt but it was a physical thing but a lot of those people were never saved they were called out and many of them died in the wilderness in fact of the ones that were 20 and older or over 20 I got to check to make sure if it's over 20 or 20 and over only two made it to the promised land Joshua and Caleb they were spiritually saved I'm not saying all the ones that died were not spiritually saved, but a great number of them were. We see that in Hebrews, that they died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. But God's purpose was to save a remnant, and we see that Israel's failure was its own fault and not God's fault. 
God's purpose always stands. Whatever He purposes, He achieves. Many say the passage speaks of national privilege, not salvation, but this carries no weight for the following reasons. One, its primary purpose. God is absolutely free in the bestowal of His grace and favor. To answer those Jews who believe they had the right to God's blessing, uh, Jesus gave a parable in Matthew about a landowner that went out and hired people all during the day, and at the end of the day, He gave them all the same amount. And some of them said, we've been here through the heat of the day and we get no more than the ones at the end of the day. I don't know when you were called. But the, the promise by God is eternal life. It's not to give benefits for a merit-based system because we're not on a merit-based system. And he, he said, isn't it my right to do with what I want to. So both Paul and Jesus is making the same argument when he's saying, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. Jesus said, I will pay what I promise to pay. And that's what we call the sovereignty of God. None of us deserve to be with Christ. None of us deserve eternal life. But by grace, not by achievement, but by grace, there will be a multitude no person can number in the age to come with Christ. All that is said of Jacob and his seed in a physical material sense can be said of the new covenant people which we are, but it's in a different it's a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. The Old Testament was a type. It was a picture. It was not the true. It was real, but it wasn't the true. The promise was fulfilled. And 2 Corinthians says, 1.20, All the promises are yes and amen in Christ. Not in Israel, but in Christ. The old covenant of Israel was redeemed, called, sanctified, and adopted, and given a heirship. They were heirs. They received an inheritance. And yet the terms applied is not the same as it is in the New Covenant people. It was the pattern of God's sovereign electing mercy and showing favor to one son who is equally undeserving and unworthy as the other one. If he did it on merit, neither son would have inherited anything. It was by grace that Jacob inherited it. It was by grace that Isaac inherited. Under inspiration of the Spirit, when we see this, we will know that God doesn't owe anything to us. We have never given God anything that makes us owners of Him or Him in debt to us. It's based solely on His sovereign good pleasure. So if God chooses to bless some and pass over others, we cannot claim that He's unfair. To be fair, He would put us all in hell. We don't want that. So what we're saying is, I know better than God. I've said that myself. God, I don't like the way you did that. Mainly because we have failed to grasp our own corruption and are so bold to suggest that God should have done it because we think He ought to do it this way and this way and this way. But we don't know everything that God does. I remember a week or two ago, Brock and I were talking about some of the screw-ups in our lives. And yet God kept with us. It didn't mean it was a pleasant time all the time. Did you know that Jacob and Esau, there wasn't a day in Jacob's life that God didn't bring him in conformity, discipline him and beat him and chasten him for what he did, and he let Esau just go free and do what he wanted to. And we say, God's unfair. Look what God had to do to Jacob to get him in line so he could be Israel. 
And yet he gave Esau an inheritance too. But it wasn't the inheritance. Psalm 119.68 We learn from God's decrees because He's a good God. Isn't it the original sin to question God? Isn't that what Adam and Eve did when serpent said, Has God not said? And they fell into sin. We need to be aware that we are not to question God. He speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. Then he speaks to Pharaoh showing he was dealing with two individuals. And neither one of these were great guys. We make heroes of some of these people. I'm not saying that Moses wasn't a great man. He was. But he was a sinner. Both deserving wrath and curse. So how can Yahweh hold us responsible? Why does He still find fault we see in verse 19? Clearly God is not speaking of His prescriptive will here. That means He gives us laws. The first one is to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And none of us have ever done that. And then He says, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And we haven't done that either. And then in, under the New Covenant, God gives an enhanced version of that. He said, I want you to love your brothers and others, even your enemies, like Christ loved you. Whoa. Can you fathom that? But he is talking here about his decreed will. It's a secret will that we don't know what the answer is. We're judged on what He commands us to do. But He moves and acts outside of that. We choose freely what we want most at any point. He judges us for it while we carry out His will. Like the Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And yet He judged them for it anyway. And He says, Has the potter not the right over the clay? If He wants to use our rebellious, culpable acts that we do freely to accomplish His will and purpose and then judge us for it, it is His prerogative to do so. And we don't have a leg to stand on. We see in Isaiah 29, 16. Where the prophet says, Surely you have things turned around. When we question God, aren't we turning things around? That's exactly what we're doing. We don't have the right to do that. If we turn this around, and those who do have little hope of understanding grace, when we think we can put ourselves in the place of God and question what He does, and we have no sense of what grace is, we're judging God on the basis of us. We need a grace that saves. And that's what God has given us in Christ. Our God is the Most High who rules in the kingdoms of men and is mighty to save. There's a, in Matthew 12, I got it here. He says, all things, I'm sorry, wrong verse, 20. I said, I was in the wrong chapter. No wonder I couldn't find it. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will deliver justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. What the 
people of that day would do, they would go and find them a cane and make a flute out of it and they would, you know how cane is real flimsy? And they, they would break it and they'd just throw it away and get another one until they got one that would work. And what Jesus is saying here is He's not going to do that. He's going to call these broken reeds to Himself. He's going to mend them and mend them and mend them and not throw them out. And a smoking flax, what is that? Have you ever had an oil lamp where it ran out of oil? And the wick began to burn and stink? And then you get rid of it? God's not going to do that. If you're His, He puts more oil in the lamp and it burns brightly. A burning lamp. Give me oil in my lamp. Why would God do that? You know, He doesn't save a better version of ourselves. He saves us as we are, but He doesn't leave us as we are. In other words, He saves us in spite of who we are. John 3.16 says, God loved the world in this way. He gave His unique Son so that all the ones believing in Him will have everlasting life and not perish on the last day. Why? That's what we started with last week. Why and because. Why? Amazing grace. Amazing love. How can it be? That song, How Can It Be? Well, I love that song. How can it be that God would love me? That He would have grace on me? It's grace and mercy and love. Because, John 3.16, God loved the world in this way. He gave His unique Son so that all the ones believing will not perish but have everlasting life. Come to Christ today. He will in no wise cast you out. He says, a bruised reed He will not throw away. A smoking flax He will not put out. If not now, when? Let me ask you something. Could Christ come today? Oh yes. It's urgent that you believe and repent now. You don't even know if you will live the day out. I got up this morning and uh, found out my brother's mother-in-law had died. And then we heard that Rush Limbaugh had died. Last year, I've lost four or five of my friends that were younger than I am. And I'm not that old. I lost my twin brother too. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You need to repent and believe today. You might die before the second coming. Or you might die before the day is over. God will come when His purposes are done. It has nothing to do with seven years of tribulation and an antichrist and one world government and all that. It's when the last person that He wants to save is saved He's coming because no one knows the day or the hour. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. Maybe a hundred years from now. You want, But you don't have a hundred years to live, do you? It is not the prerogative of us who, when we die. It's not the prerogative of the United States or China or any other nation when Christ comes back. It is His prerogative. If you hear His voice... 